Hello, today I'm standing at the top of the Erpeler Lai and below you can see the remains of the bridge at Raymargen. Uh, the two towers on the western bank, I'm on the eastern bank. Uh, below me somewhere there is a tunnel. Uh, there are two, tunnel, two uh, towers uh, on this side, on the eastern bank as well and that leads then a bit further back leads into the tunnel which goes through this uh, huge uh, volcanic uh, rock structure. I'll take the camera out a bit so you can see a little bit more. Here we have the Rhine and uh, it is the Rhine is a comparatively pretty straight river. It sort of goes north uh, north to south in a relatively straight line. Okay, look, you've got a bend in it there. And if I bring this round here, you've got a bend down there. But as far as rivers go, it's pretty straight on the whole. Only from its south, uh, south to north direction, turning off uh, to the west, uh, to the north of Dusseldorf and going through uh, distributaries uh, to the North Sea. As such, the Rhine was a very easy uh, river to defend. And uh, so this had the consequence of making it a natural barrier during the Second World War. First uh, attempt to cross the Rhine was, of course, the Battle of Arnhem in 1942, and a Rhine crossing was made, but of course, that failed. And so on the 7th of March 1945, uh, somewhere over there, a Lieutenant Tinnemans uh, of the 7th Arm Armoured Brigade, he noticed that the bridge here was still standing. And if you've seen the film, uh, the bridge at Ray Margen, uh, you, one gets the impression that it's somewhere near the Apollonia Kirche uh, church over there. I'm going to bring the camera in a bit close so you can see the church. And uh, obviously it wasn't there, it was, it was from a hilltop, some, some, somewhere over here. They saw that the bridge was still standing. And then um, uh, he uh, made it down to the bridge approach and then a crossing was made. In the film, uh, it's given the impression that they're given orders uh, that they uh, don't really want to carry out. but. Um, from the recollections of the people who were there, that that is not the case. Although, to be quite honest, I, I could understand it. If I was somewhere near the bridge approach on the other side of the river, I wouldn't be too pleased about having to make a dash across this wide river on a girder bridge, uh, particularly as they've uh, seen other bridges that had blown up uh, just before the, uh, they, they actually got there. So um, the problem was of course large amounts of uh, German troops were on the other side uh, also as shown in the, uh, as, as you see in the film and um, uh, but what, what was different from the film was that orders to blow up bridges were not at all clear. Uh, because on the night of the 14th, 15th of October 1944, there was an air raid on Cologne. And the air raid uh, somehow hit the, uh, uh, it detonated the explosive, explosives on the Mülheimer Bridge, blew up. And uh, that, uh, that wasn't the name of the game, to blow bridges up. Now, all bridges had, even when this was built, uh, from 1916 to 1918, or inaugurated in 1919, uh, sp places were left for uh, like the holes in the in it, so it could be blown up if necessary. Now it's said that uh, during the French uh, occupation of the Rhineland uh, after the First World War, that the the places uh, where the bridge could be blown up, the special areas were were concreted over. Uh, who actually did it uh, seems to there seems to be some dispute. 
whether it was done by the locals as an act of resistance, thinking the French might blow it up, or by the French themselves to stop it uh, in the future being blown up as a, as a potential way of um, a highway into Germany, as they said in the film uh, uh, of Bridget Ray Morgan. So the uh, so all the bridges did uh, now the 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 orders were that uh, bridges were prepared for demolition only when the enemy was within eight kilometres. Eight kilometres. Now just look how it's not that far. Eight kilometres. You can walk eight kilometres in two hours, even carrying a pack stack of equipment. Uh, eight kilometres. Somebody could do that in a in a vehicle uh, easily, even in those time within ten minutes. I mean, not going to prepare a bridge for demolition in ten minutes. Uh, particularly a bridge, a bridge of this size. Uh, in the case of Remagen, 600 kilos of uh, high explosive uh, were ordered. So you know, how are you going to place it? That takes a very long time to actually do. So the orders were unclear. Uh, to make it more complicated, there'd been changes in the um, command structure. And um, uh, Captain Bradka, um, who uh, who was shown as uh, in the film uh, have, with, a, with a different name, I can't remember what it was now. Uh, he, he was the person in charge. He was a school teacher, and uh, he came to some of the memorial meetings after the war as well. Uh, and he uh, he didn't even know who his superior was. So when the Americans were sighted, he uh, tried to contact somebody who. Had, was no longer his superior. Uh, he had 36 men here, and he had, okay, he did have support from uh, some uh, Ru uh, some Russians, or some, some Soviet Red Army people, volunteers, uh, some uh, Volkssturm, the Home Guard. He had uh, Hitler Youth, uh, and there was some Luftwaffe personnel. There's about 200 Luftwaffe personnel, uh, which are shown as being actually up here in the film. Shown as being up here in the Erpel of Lai, uh, up here, and. Um, they, as it, uh, that, that's actually incorrect. They didn't have such heavy weapons as shown in the film, the 88 millimeter weapons. Um, they had much lighter weapons. But uh, one thing uh, which was uh, in the area was over there somewhere was a number of experimental rocket launchers, which were anti-aircraft rocket launchers. It looks a bit like a beer crate, or a crate, a crate for holding bottles. And so that's how it got its name, as the beer crate. Uh, they were experimental secret, and the uh, person who uh, uh, had the uh, in charge of them, he actually, he turned up over here in transit and his um, asking for the bridge not to be blown up, he needed to get his equipment uh, across the bridge again. And uh, 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 Petters, Captain Petters. So, uh, uh, there were, he had a number of people under his command, and there were also lots of stragglers and the, the uh, bridge security tried to get the stragglers to actually stop, but it, 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 they, they weren't interested and they couldn't actually order them to do anything. <clears throat> and this also because of the command structure was wrong. So the anti-aircraft people were commanded by the, um, uh, the Luftwaffe, the people uh, responsible for the uh, Wehrkreis, the, uh, who had the, um, the military zones, but the uh, military zones were the, with the, those responsible for blowing up the bridges were commanded eff effectively by the SS. And the army uh, was it independent, so there was n absolutely no command structure whatsoever. Now, the, uh, the bridge did receive explosives, but they were then, the explosives were taken away and redeployed. And that then, uh, with this redeployment, meant there was nothing here. So they were begging for explosives to blow up the bridge. Uh, but they, when they did arrive, there was only 300 
kilos, not 600 kilos, and it was industrial explosive and not the military explosive. So uh, they had half of what was asked for, and it had, I don't know what the explosive power was, but I, I suspect it might have been four times less. I suspect, uh, I cannot, I don't know, so I might stand to be corrected on that one. So uh, a situation which developed here for the defenders was pretty catastrophic, really. They had, uh, they'd been promised, as shown in the film, all sorts of uh, reinforcements. The reinforcements never turned up, if they ever existed in the first place. There was no command structure. And those who were here probably didn't want to fight anyway. They knew the war was over. So uh, what, co what, could, what could they do? So uh, there was a cable was laying out. Now the bridge approach itself was blown and that's on the other side. Uh, but when they tried to blow the bridge up, the cable appears to have been hit by artillery. When uh, Lieutenant Tinnerman, he asked for the tanks uh, and uh, to actually bombard the bridge. Again, that's shown in the film quite clearly. And uh, he asked for the uh, proximity fuses to be used. They, they, that, that was denied. A proximity fuse sort of blows up in the area of, uh, it doesn't, it's not a direct, so normally things are contact, so shell hits on contact, but proximity blows up in the area of it. So, so the thing was that this was refused because it thought it might hit American soldiers. Uh, in the air, which, which is which is understandable. So the Americans were the, uh, were shelling the bridge, and uh, it seems so the cable was actually hit. Probably the cable was hit, so the bridge initially didn't. Uh, but there was a, again as shown in the film, there was a place where it could be lit manually. That was done and okay there was an explosion a lot of damage was caused to the bridge maybe the bridge jumped up maybe that happened it's it's not clear it's not clear what happened and the uh anyway it was still standing and the americans got across first person i crossed, crossed was sergeant drabek his parents came from they were from Germany, although they were Polish speakers, they came from Hohensalza today, in Wrocław. Lieutenant Tinnemans, the first uh, American officer across, next. He was born uh, somewhere in the area of Frankfurt. His mother was German, his father had been in the occupation troops in the First World War, and they'd met. And they'd gone back to the United States. Uh, so the first two across were of German, German origin. And uh, uh, the battle, however, which is actually seen in the film as being, um, okay, there was a, this, this race to get tanks over. Uh, there was a tank tried to get over and it fell into a, a hole which was created by the, uh, the explosion on the bridge. But the, once Americans were over, and they got over in the afternoon, not as shown in the, in, in the film uh, at night, then they had to get over this this Erpele lie, and you can see from things I filmed from the bottom how difficult that would have been. So they got over the top of this, then went down the other side. Absolutely amazing, uh, in my opinion, to do something like that. Incredible, because uh, it's so steep on its western side. Uh, they captured the other end of the tunnel, and thus began the battle for the uh, Remagen bridgehead, which was then formed. Americans were poured in the area. Uh, the, uh, once the Wehrmacht found out, uh, General Mordel didn't find out until the following day, a good 24 hours later, about that the bridge had been captured. There was, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, there was attempts to counterattack as shown in the film but they the counterattacks were far too weak they didn't have the uh, support and major anti-aircraft battle 
in this area here. This all happened in the two weeks following the capture of the bridge. Uh, the attempts to blow up the bridge, including a special uh, frogman unit, uh, which was defeated by something called oh, a special type of secret light developed in the United Kingdom even before the Second World War. Uh, but Americans' tanks had been equipped with it. But anyway, they were spotted by this light. There were attempts to, to hit it with um, uh, V-2 missiles, uh, which were launched from the north, from Holland and they weren't very successful although they did kill uh, civilians, one case they killed three Americans uh, the closest the missile hit was 250 meters to the north which is quite my opinion was pretty good for the time there's no way something like that could have hit a tiny target and um, the most successful attacks however I think probably and I'm not a structural engineer, so I don't know. But the most successful attacks were done with artillery. So all sorts of artillery was being brought in, the, including the enormous siege guns, of which there were only 10 ever manufactured, of the 54 centimeter, 540 millimeter. And uh, they had 14 pot shots at the bridge, all of them missed. Uh, but. Um, and then, then the, the gun gave up. But artillery bombardments from sort of standard uh, weapons. Uh, on the 17th of March 1945, the bridge fell into the Rhine. But by that time, there were plenty of other bridges across. And indeed, uh, the Americans had limited the use of the bridge. For example, when a fuel truck was hit and uh, they wouldn't allow any more fuel trucks, and then they decided that tanks couldn't cross the bridge. They had to use the, uh, the, um, uh, the pontoon bridges. So the, uh, the reason why it fell into the Rhine, well, we don't know, but it was bombed earlier so it could have been weakened by that plus the the use of uh, the the other um the, the the attempt to blow it up um it has often said that it, it fell into the rhine because it was the use it was put to but bear in mind that that bridge down there was a railway bridge and trains are pretty heavy things um no train was running over it uh, from, from American troops. I suspect, however, it was the artillery and then something happened which broke the, cam the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. That's what I imagine happened. And that's why the bridge fell into the Rhine. Anyway, I've done quite a number of videos from here. Look at this, isn't it wonderful to be here? Fantastic weather, lovely scenery. And uh, so if you're interested in this type of thing, I upload every uh, Friday at 20, 100 hours my time. I'm in Germany and Poland, sometimes Italy, and sometimes in the United Kingdom when it's 1900 hours there. So thanks for watching, and hope you found it interesting. And all the best from me in Germany. <laughs>